Well, it's good to see you, and it's good to be here, and uh, thankful for this another opportunity we've been given to to visit together and to uh, worship together and to study together. And I always appreciate your kind attention, and uh, I'd never want to waste your time. And so we'll uh, uh, try to put this Lord's Day to good use. Speaking of the Lord's Day and um, the uh, opportunities that it brings for us here, uh, we do look forward, uh, if the Lord wills, to an opportunity uh, this evening to meet together at 5 o'clock. Before that, at 4 o'clock, this is the third Sunday, so for the men here uh, who are interested in leading, uh, we are meeting again this afternoon at 4, uh, and we're talking about the subject of the public reading of the scriptures. Uh, in fact, uh, the last, uh, we met one other time, and uh, we had some fellows volunteer for the passages, and I trust you've been reading and going over those verses, and uh, we will... Uh, put that to uh, good use this afternoon and we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to read the scripture and uh, to talk about uh, the effectiveness of that and ways we can improve. And so uh, uh, remember that effort this afternoon, please. And as we said, we're not trying to make it hard on families. Uh, I don't think there'd be any issue, uh, you know, rather than having to take two cars if folks, if it's better and easier for them, uh, just to come on and, uh, the fellows who are leading will sit up here and we can, uh, we can certainly make use of everybody here in those terms. So be glad for you to be there for that. Uh, also tonight, Lord willing, after the service, uh, we plan a few minutes afterward to uh, convene again and to uh, have our prayer meeting. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with that, we have for a number of years on the third Sunday night uh, taken an occasion to meet together to mention names of Christians and non-Christians that are on our hearts and then make a special prayer for those folks. And uh, we certainly would be glad uh, to have you come and, and encourage us and help us in that effort. This morning, I want to talk to you about a question that uh, was asked recently. We do have a question box in the back or topics to, to be suggested for lessons. Um, I guess in some places that could be a dangerous thing. <laughs> Because there are some folks who may have the attitude or the idea in mind, we want to try to stump the preacher. Well, that's not too hard. Or that we want to get a lesson to get it, that guy over there because I want to get him. I've never had any kind of feeling that that was the spirit here. I think the questions that are asked here, without exception, have been honest questions, uh, points either the, the person who was asking the question were wondering about or... Maybe they just felt like this is an important subject that we need to hear more about, and I always appreciate those kind of suggestions. Some of them might be uh, more uh, complicated, some of them quite simple. Uh, the question that I was asked recently was, uh, would you talk about the importance of the name Church of Christ? And I think that's a worthy question, a worthy point. You know, the idea of a name uh, religiously has been downplayed a good bit through the years, uh, and there are those who uh, maybe have, uh, have felt that uh, we have the liberty just to make up whatever name uh, comes uh, to be most useful to us or what we think is best. Um, I, I read an article here a while back in which a fellow was talking about how to name a church. I thought, well, that is an article. Uh, that's a topic for you. And he was talking about how that in, in modern times, you know, it used to be that a group would name itself after a foundational doctrine or after a founder. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Lutheran church, there's not much mystery about where that name came from. Although, I, I brought the book, but I didn't bring it up here. You know, if you look at the Lutheran handbook, you know what I find to be funny? is in the Luther, one of the Lutheran handbooks. It has a section on history, and it points out how that Martin Luther asked his followers not to name the church or call themselves after Luther. That's in the Lutheran handbook. Well, anyway, so much for listening. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, people have tended to move away from that. You know, the, the Presbyterian church is named originally after the idea that we don't have bishops that rule over everybody. We've got presbyters that 
you know, or a different organization there or the Baptist church because unlike the other groups that sprinkle, we immerse. Um, the, the Methodist church, that was out of a term of derision, really, uh, for John Wesley and Charles Wesley and their followers. Uh, they were so methodical in their, in their uh, prayer and in their service to God. And so these names came about in various ways. Today, people are moving away from such monikers and going to other names. This particular fellow says, here are some of the popular choices. He says the word point has become ubiquitous. <laughs> Life point, cross point. If you want to get famous, add an E at the end of it. So it's P-O-I-N-T-E. <laughs> uh, life is big. Now, stick life in the name. New life, real life. Life point. Um, Redeemer, redemption. Um, uh, over the last 10 years, he said names like journey or bridge or foundry or generation uh, have all the, uh, been popular names that have been stuck in there. New is a big word too. New life, new hope, new song, new point, whatever it might be, and so on. Um, I thought the song that we just sang was quite appropriate. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Does the Lord have a say in this matter? Does it make a difference? What we call ourselves religiously? Well, I want to take you to Acts chapter 11 and, and think about a name that was, uh, that was given to uh, those who were the followers of Christ here. Uh, Acts 11, verse 25, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek for Saul. Now he's going to get Saul, Saul of Tarsus, fairly recently converted, who has been back in his uh, home area, because the work down in Antioch of Syria is just going gangbusters. It's just great. And so he wants Saul to come and help him. And, uh, and so it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Um, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. If you read uh, certain Bible commentaries, what they will tell you is that, well, actually that was a term of derision, uh, mocking that some of the locals uh, threw at these folks and it stuck over the years and so that's where we got the name Christian. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that's true. And, and, and the primary reason why I don't is because it's just not the right word. That word called is not a word for derision. It's a word that's associated with that which comes from God. Uh, Mr. Mounts in defining the word says in the New Testament this word krematizo means to utter a divine communication. It's used nine times in the New Testament. Look with me at, at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25. And, uh, you know, Hebrews 12, 25, uh, maybe should have put these on the chart for time's sake, but uh, didn't. But uh, Hebrews 12, 25 reads, See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven? The idea of the speaking there is obviously not just uh, human, mere human wisdom. This is the idea of Moses and now Christ who comes to utter the words of God. That's what this word is, that's how it's used. It's used that way consistently. This is uh, some utterance uh, under divine influence. In Matthew chapter 2, um, and the story here is uh, familiar to us, Matthew chapter 2. Uh, it was uh, Mary and Joseph that were warned of, I'm sorry, the, the, the wise men, she said, warned of God to dream that they should not return to Herod. They were warned of God. That's the way this word is used. Not just uh, just human conversation, but the idea of something that's related to a message coming from God. In 2 and verse 22, uh, when they heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea uh, in the room of his father Herod, they were afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, uh, Mary and Joseph went to Nazareth. Again, the idea of the warning here is obviously a divine message something divinely instructed, a revelation that is received. 
um, in, in, in Acts chapter 10. Uh, and in verse 22, here's the story of the household of Cornelius. And Cornelius the centurion is a just man. Peter was told he's one that uh, fears God of a good report among all the nations of the Jews being warned from God by a holy angel. Now, he says at the end of this, after giving several other examples, he says intransitively, it, it is uh, to receive an appellation. We don't use that word anymore, but it's the idea of simply being named, being called something. And so this is the way the word's used. He gives our passage, the disciples were called Christians, and one other in Romans chapter 7 and verse 3. Look at Romans 7, 3 a minute. Uh, Romans 7, 3 is where Paul is talking about making the comparison between uh, how that, uh, you know, you can't be married to uh, two women at one time. One woman can't have two husbands. And we can't be married to the old law and the new law. And so we've got to be dead to one to marry to the other. So in 7, 3, in the illustration, he says this. He says, if while her husband lives... She be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. The word called is our word. Now he's not saying that she's going to be called that. Oh, she may not really be. That's just somebody's opinion. No. What he's saying is she's called that because that's the way God defines her. That's a God-given appellation, name, title, description. And so when we come back to our passage, it takes on a very different light than some commentators suggest. That this is not just uh, some sort of uh, a snide remark made in Antioch. But in Antioch, God revealed a name that had his approval. And it's used with his approval, not many times, but a few times in the scripture. That is the name Christian. It's a good name. It's a God-chosen name. It's a high name. Uh, we would admit, frankly, it's not the only name that God approved of. Uh, or that is used with God's approval in the scripture. There are other names that are used. Now, sometimes uh, those who were uh, indeed uh, Christians were called simply the disciples. They, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Before they were known as Christians, they were known as the disciples. Uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Uh, Paul and, and, uh, and Barnabas were confirming the souls of the disciples. They had taught them. They had seen them converted. They went back through and, uh, and tried to strengthen the disciples. In uh, Philippians chapter 1, uh, Paul writes about the brethren. Uh, earlier in that same uh, letter, he had written to the saints. Uh, and uh, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, he talks about the children of God. So there are several different names uh, in the New Testament that I think may be used and used accurately, used with God's authority, to describe Christians and who they are. Um, uh, and uh, I think that uh, when it comes to a collective, uh, how do we describe the, the Christians in a collective sense, whether it be all the Christians or whether it be all the Christians who have agreed to work together in a particular place? Well, I think likewise we can go to the Scriptures and we can find uh, examples of such. Um, in Romans 16 and verse 16. Here's the way the Holy Spirit described them. Uh, putting into Paul's uh, uh, mind these words, the churches of Christ salute you. Uh, what's the significance of that name? Well, it has a meaning. We'll talk about that maybe just a second. I'll tell you something else. It has God's approval. Now, that's something you can't say about just any name. Uh, and I think it has a, a, what it says in its message that here are the called out that belong to Christ. And that's really all it says is a powerful statement to live up to. Are there any other names in the scripture? Yes, I think there are other names in the scriptures. For example, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, you know, Paul there in talking to the elders from Ephesus uh, encourages them, exhorts them, take heed therefore to yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which is purchased with his own blood. Is it scriptural to talk about the people of God as the church of God? It certainly is. And that's a, a name that is a worthy name. One of the things that we do come in into to, uh, contact with is the fact that there are groups who have... Uh, uh, taken this name and hijacked it 
And uh, if somebody were to ask me or to ask you, are you a member of the church of God? I would say, absolutely I am. But I would feel where we live and the time we live to explain to them and say, well, now let me say this. When I say I'm a member of the church of God, I'm not talking about a group whose headquarters is in Anderson, Indiana or uh, in Cleveland, Tennessee. That's another group there. But am I a member of the church of God? I better be. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, Paul talks about the edifying of the body of Christ. I hope we can continue our study from Ephesians tonight. Uh, I really was very bright. You know, I started this series and then, you know, two Sundays I wasn't able to get to it. But, but I hope tonight to get back there. But, um, you know, Ephesians has a good bit to say about the church. Uh, and it describes the church as the body of Christ. Are you a member of the body of Christ? I believe that's a, a scriptural term. Uh, you have other appellations, and we're not going to give them all. Here, the, the church of the living God, Paul once described it. Several others along that line. So, you know, when we talk about the importance of the name Church of Christ, it's important because it's a God-given name. It's important because it's a God-given concept. It's important because it is something that we are called to live up to. It, it's important because... We do all things in his name. Whatever we do in word or deed, we do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's why I find it to be offensive when people, like they do with every other aspect of the worship and of the work, we just think somehow we can come up with our own ideas and follow our own way. And you find some real doozies out there. We've already mentioned some names that men have chosen. Uh, through the years, there have been... One group called itself the Run for Your Life International Chapel. I thought, well, that's interesting. It that brings up a, an image, doesn't it? Or the Atomic Bomb Prayer Ministry. I remember there was an outfit, I think it was down in Tuscaloosa County somewhere, and they called themselves the Holy Ghost Repair Service Incorporated. Well, that's creative. What's the matter with it? What's the matter with it? It's just not from God. That's something that some man thought of that'd be clever or he thought would be a good idea. But how about this? How about if we're going to try to be the church that belongs to Christ? We're going to follow the Bible pattern. I'm not trying to limit the Bible pattern to less than it is. But it's not our place to simply use our wisdom uh, where God has already given instruction and example. And that's the problem. Uh, one of the things that was involved in the questioner, uh, the question asked by the questioner was, what about the idea of maybe shifting away from a name like Church of Christ and going to something else, changing the name? That's something that I've heard about. You know, I've been at this a while, and, uh, and I've uh, seen and heard of groups uh, who decided that the name Church of Christ was too offensive or too controversial, and we just need to take that off of the front door. Well, actually, it's not just our brethren who have those kinds of questions and those kinds of issues. Um, there are uh, there are the same kind of discussions that go on among uh, denominational groups, Protestant groups, for example. Um, I, I, I recently was made aware of the fact that there was a a group that split off from the Presbyterian Church USA. Had a little bit of dealing with these folks. Where we, I was in West Virginia, we were right down the street from a group that was a, affiliated with this organization, um, and. Um, the Presbyterian Church USA as a group became quite liberal in its thinking, in its acceptance of uh, homosexuality and some other just things that were really uh, quite, uh, quite uh, uh, bold uh, and, and stepping away from just basic Bible morality and so on. And there were folks in that organization that were quite offended by that. And so they decided they would get away from that. Well, that's probably a good idea. But uh, what they decided to do instead was create their own organization. And what they created was something called the Evangelical Covenant Order of Presbyterians. And I think they go now by the acronym ECO, ECHO, I guess. I'm not sure they pronounce it that way. But anyway, that's what that is. Uh, if you saw that, ECO, you probably wouldn't know what in the world he was talking about. But that's what it is. But there's an example of the idea of a uh, of, of Protestant church that says we need to change the name. Um, but, but the problem is that we're going from one thing that God hasn't authorized to another thing. 
And though their, their motives in some cases might be good, there's just, there's just a better way to do that. Well, our brethren have caught some of the same spirit. They said, we need to get away from the name, the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ meets here. That was a simple sign you used to see quite a bit. Sometimes we do this here. We'll put a moniker up there to identify uh, the location of a local congregation so that folks can find our literature, whatever it might be, on the web. So it's the North Bib Church of Christ or the East Main or the West Main or whatever it is. And what that's simply saying is that, that the folks here, the, the local body, the Church of Christ, that is this group that is meeting together, organized under God's authority, simply trying to be the church that belongs to him, that meets at this place. We, we're glad to have you. This is where we meet. There are those who felt like that it might be better if we uh, dropped that term, changed it. Um, when people, by the way, that was not the, the ambition of the questioner, uh, but uh, I don't think anybody here has ever suggested that that I can remember. But through the years, you run into folks who think that is a good idea. Some of them are quite sincere about that. We want to try to, to be as, as uh, free from uh, uh, offense as we can. Well, I appreciate that ambition in some ways. I think 1 Corinthians chapter 9 would remind us that we're not here to do anything, to throw any obstacle in the way of people coming to Christ. And so Paul would say individually, he'd say, when I'm with the strict Jew, I will try to be as respectful of their traditions as possible. And when I'm with somebody who doesn't know anything about the law, I don't try to make them feel bad about things that God does not make his law. I appreciate that spirit. Uh, but I think sometimes there's something else involved here. One of the questions that, that I, I sometimes will ask the, the, the person who says, maybe we need to drop Church of Christ from the signage or whatever, advertisement. I will say, well... Help me understand here. What is it that's offensive to you? Church, Christ, or of? Which one of those three is the problem? Because I, I don't think any of those should be a problem. I know, I know where they're coming from. What they're saying is uh, th that the name is just so controversial, just puts so many people off that uh, we just do better if we did something else. That may be true in some cases, that is, that that, that name is offensive. But you know what I find to be sadder than that. Um, I may have mentioned this to you before. I, I moonlighted up at the news, uh, Birmingham News, when there was a Birmingham News, in a very humble capacity for a little while. And I, they had this open concept. They didn't believe in offices. They liked one big newsroom, you know. So uh, I was in there with the, with the real writers and editors and big shots, you know. And um, I got to know a few of them. And uh, as we want to do, we'd try to talk about religion. And I met maybe one or two that uh, they'd talk about, you know, oh, you're one of them Campbellites, you know, all that nonsense. <clears throat> they, they were aware at least of maybe the direction they thought I was coming from. But you know what I found to be most disturbing? I, I, I talked to people about, uh, about, you know, where I was and what we were about and what we were trying to do to honor Jesus. And, uh, and then the next time they'd say, what would you say you were, Church of God? Church of what? They'd never heard of it. And, and as I've said, they didn't know the difference between the Church of God, the Churches of Christ, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or Church's Chicken. They didn't know anything about who we were or what it was that we taught. And I thought, that's because we're not teaching enough. <laughs> or maybe they're not listening. You know, I, I, I wish there was a little more pushback and prejudice. That would suggest at least that somebody's got some of the message. Although I wouldn't rejoice in their being stubborn to it. But anyway, the point is that, uh, you know, I don't think that, that maybe the prejudice is nearly as important or nearly as big a problem to me as just the absolute ignorance of the whole issue. We're trying to be the church that belongs to Christ and that alone. No denomination, no earthly headquarters. We're just Christians and together just the church of Christ. That's a very different message 
than many folks through the years have taught. And that's what we believe, and that's what we're, we're really announcing by that name. But there are those who have, uh, have agreed that, yes, we need to make a change. This last little symbol here is from an outfit in South Texas, around the San Antonio area. Uh, this is the group that's, that uh, 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 Max Lucado is affiliated with. Some of you guys may have heard of him. Uh, he's written a lot of books and sold a lot of books. And anyway, Max Lucado, uh, it, it was said for years, was a member of the Church of Christ, whatever he believed. I, I don't think he's one of us doctrinally at all. But this group used to be known as the Oak Hills Church of Christ. But uh, Lucado and others uh, decided that uh, they needed to make a change and drop the name Christ and just have Oak Hills Church. And he was interviewed about that. This has been, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. And um, uh, this particular interviewer was from the Baptist Press. And so in the Baptist Press, they wrote this article. And the article was entitled, Max Lucado, or Lucado, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Transcends Church of Christ Beliefs. And um, he, in the article he says, Lucado's Church of Christ, not a typical Church of Christ. Uh, for starters, instrumental music is, is used, although there is still one a cappella service. At least there was when this article was written. Also, the church has a baptismic view of baptism. That is, baptism isn't required uh, for salvation. So he's saying, in other words, they teach what uh, the, the typical Baptist church would teach about that. Baptism isn't required for salvation. Recently, his church, which has 5,000 members, even changed its name from Oak Hills Church of Christ to simply Oak Hills Church. And Lucado is quoted saying, we receive criticism, of course, but our thinking is that we're not here to please other churches. Uh, we're just uh, here to try to reach San Antonio. Uh, he explained further, I was really struck that many people would not visit our church because of the name. They had a bad experience somewhere with the Church of Christ. Um, I, I just pause there just a minute. You know, that, that, that could be true. But you know, you got the name church up there. I imagine some folks have had a bad experience at some church of any stripe. I would just get rid of that too. Just call it Oak Hill or something. Uh, he goes on, I've never had an allegiance to the name. Oak Hills has never fit into that mold of a church of Christ. There are people in the church of Christ who believe they're the only ones going to heaven. We never believed that. I never believed that. We were never exclusively an a cappella in our music. A lot of churches of Christ are. We always had instrumentation. We never taught the buzz phrase is baptismal regeneration where you go into the baptistry lost and come out saved. We never taught that. Now, I'm not saying there were not people in our church who believed that. So he says we didn't quite fit the mold of the church of Christ. So the reason why they changed it, he's rather bold in saying, is because we just don't believe what's associated with that name. Well, if that's the case, it'd be good to take the name off because it'd be deceptive uh, to put a name up there that would not be representative of what's going on inside. But what I hope and pray is that you and I will, in the first place, never be ashamed, uh, no matter what the reaction might be, uh, of standing for the principles that the name represents. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter said, you know, don't ever suffer as a thief or a murderer or as a meddler in other men's matters. But if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in this name. If somebody's ashamed uh, because they were mean and callous and um, uh, malicious and, and uh, harsh toward others and unloving, they ought to be ashamed of that. That's, that's the world. But if we simply read a passage and say, I believe that and I hold to that, there's no need to be ashamed of the name of Christ or the name Christian if we live up to it. And that's really where I want to end the lesson. Our time is up this morning. We talk about, you know, the, the name and what name should be worn and so on and the different 
back and forth with that. But I, I think what we really ought to do is to put our energy into living up to the names that God gave his people. Uh, you know, the name Christian is a name that implies something. It, it implies a connection with Christ, doesn't it? In the same way, when you say somebody's an American, what that means is that uh, theoretically they have some loyalty to and connection with America. Now, the way some Americans act, you'd never know it. And the same is true about the name Christian. Um, in, in, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, that's where you remember uh, the Lord uh, uh, gave this chilling picture of the guy who in the judgment day says, Lord, Lord, we not prophesy out of thy name and cast out devils? Done many wonderful works. He said, I never knew you. You never wore one of mine. You wore my name, maybe. But I never did know you. Do we carry the name of Christ with dignity? Do we represent it well? Um, you know, the folks sitting in this room right now that are going to be going out to work tomorrow morning, do people see Christ living in us? Or would they be shocked and amazed based on what they see through the week, what we're singing about on Sunday? God forbid that that be the case. That's where I would really put my concentration. Do I live up to the love and the, and the mercy and the truth of Jesus? The name disciple Likewise, suggest the idea of a follower. Here's a master and here's a pupil, somebody who models themselves after the master. Does that really describe me? You know, am I the kind of person just living day by day trying to get more and more like Jesus? People talk about Jesus and it's so cheap. And my Christianity may be a mile wide and an inch deep, but real Christianity, being a disciple of Jesus means that that uh, if you'd have known me 10 years ago and you know me today, you would have seen I have become more like Christ every day by his grace and mercy. Because that's my life, to be more like Christ in the things I think and say and do and my priorities. The word saint is another term that's used to suggest a sanctified one, somebody who is committed to purity. Does that really describe who I am? And the name Church of Christ for that matter. Again, this is not a denomination. I've got a denomination. You've got one. I'm a Church of Christ preacher. What in the world does that mean? I don't even know. I think I know what people mean. I deny it. You know, I, I, I ought to be working for the Lord. And if that's not the case, then, then I need to be doing something else. But there's not a denomination if, if we're what we ought to be, the Church of Christ. It's simply God's people called out from the world who are committed to him who have been baptized into Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. That's what the church is. And on a local level, folks like that who have grouped together, organized together to work in the ways he's authorized. And what he's authorized is not just everything I think is good, but rather that which uh, is according to truth. In 1 Timothy, Paul writes to a young preacher, and uh, what he does is he tells him, this is what you need to do and what you need not to do. Uh, this is how you can serve the Lord. This is what you need to be aware, uh, wary of. In, in 1 Timothy 5, verse 16, he says something really interesting there. We'll not do the context justice, but he's talking about, you know, the church may support certain widows. The church may support, as a collective, certain widows who meet certain qualifications. Uh, Christian women uh, of a certain age and a certain character. But others who may need help, need help, but they need to be helped individually. Um, verse 16, if any man or woman have, that believes have widows, let them relieve them. And let not the church be charged that it may relieve those that are widows indeed. Now think about that for a moment. What he's saying is that it would be wrong for the church to take money out of its treasury to help certain widows, even if they were Christians. Now think about that passage when I hear people say, well, it's a good work. Anything is a good work we can do. Man, we're not reading the Bible, not reading the same testament. They're, they're not the, the, every good work is not the church's work. There's good work to be done and a lot of work to be done by individuals, but God has given instruction about what he wants the church to be for. And let me say this. It's not about carnivals. 
And it's not about politics, and it's not even about blood pressure clinics or whatever else men decide is a good work. And I'll tell you, it's not about nothing either. The dead church is just keeping house for the Lord and not doing anything. None of that pleases God. What pleases God is uh, 1 Timothy 5 and verse, I'm sorry, 3 rather, verse 15. In case I'm delayed, Paul writes, I want to let you know how people ought to conduct themselves in the household of God because it's the church of the living God, the support and the bulwark of the truth. What the church is for, it's for the propagation and the teaching and the spread of the truth of God. And if we're not doing that, then we're not doing the work that God has given. So let me close with this statement. The Church of Christ. I'm a member of the Church of Christ. Really? The Church of Christ here. Really? That's a big claim to make. To say we are the called out of Christ here. Do we live like it? Or individually, I am a Christian. That's a big statement to make. I'm not ashamed of either one of those names. What I'm ashamed of is the thought that I don't live up to it. God forbid. May we... Realize how big shoes we have to fill. And may the Lord help us, help us to do a better job of wearing the name of Christ in a way that's true and appropriate. I appreciate your kind attention. If you have a question, you have a disagreement with me about something, please feel free to talk to me about that. And I'll listen just as, as patiently and kindly, I hope, to you as you have to me. I thank you for your consideration. Please get out your song books now. If you're here this morning and you desire to be a, a, a Christian, just like what you read about in the New Testament, just like they were, believers who turned from their sin and confessed Jesus and were baptized into Christ, you can do that today. And you'll be in Christ. And as one who's in Christ, you'll associate yourself with others of that like faith and get to work for Jesus. And uh, you can do that. Uh, but it's high time to start. So if we can help you in some way anyway, we hope you'll let us know right now while we stand, while we sing.